So today I'm going to go over the study guide. Um, and then obviously it's an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions you might have about the exam. Um, the exam is on Thursday. Um, and uh, unless you've arranged some special accommodations, um, your exam is going to be, um, the exam window will be open from one to five, same as before, 50 questions, multiple choice. Um, and once you turn in your exam um, or send in your exam, whatever, that'll be it. Unless of course you're doing the extra credit and that's due midnight on Friday. So I should have the final grades um, done within a few days, probably by the weekend. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have an idea of what you're getting based on how you've done on the exams. Uh, and of course, you'll see what you got on this exam. So um, let me just go to the share screen once again and kind of go over. So today we're going to go over the um, study guide. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, there is no class. Um, so it's kind of an extra, kind of a free day for you guys to study or do whatever you need to do. The exam on Thursday, um, as I mentioned, it's open from 1 to 5 p.m. Um, there's 50 multiple choice questions worth 100 points. And then, of course, Friday, the extra credit is due. So that kind of pretty well lays out everything um, for the exam. This, of course, will be our last time officially meeting uh, <laughs> virtually. Um, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed this semester. Kind of an unusual one, of course, without physically meeting, but hopefully you guys have learned a lot and got an appreciation for animal physiology um, before you guys embark on the next part of your careers in academia, academia or elsewhere. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hold on one second, I thought I had it up. Hold on one second here. All right, give me a second. Um, All right, so this is what you guys have. You, you've seen this obviously on Blackboard. Um, for this section, of course, for this exam, it's going to cover osmoregulation as well as renal function, um, and then endocrinology and digestion. Like I mentioned, we're not gonna go into thermoregulation. Unfortunately, I think it's a really interesting topic, but there's just no time. I think there's plenty of material for, for what we've got right here. So having said that, um, let's go through the study guide. Um, so what we went over, of course, in the beginning of our osmoregulation lecture, we went over some basic definitions of what a solute is, what a solution is, what osmosis is, what osmo, um, what osmoregulation is, um, what osmoregulators, which uh, what osmoconformers are. So you should know kind of those basic definitions. Concepts of osmosis, um, basically, of course, the concept of osmosis, it's the diffusion of water, right? Movement of water from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration, or looking at it a different way, which many people do, going from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration, trying to dilute out a more concentrated substance solution. And of course, this was very um, um, obvious when we were looking at the different challenges. So we started looking at different animals and that live in different environments and how they adapt. Um, and of course, part of that adaptation is maintaining the um, um, 
osmotic pressure, maintaining osmotic balance, right? And of course, when we think of maintaining osmotic balance, we think of maintaining the same concentration inside a cell or inside the animal and outside the animal. And of course, this is important because if that balance isn't maintained, either you're going to lose water or you're gonna gain water, or you're gonna lose solute or gain solute. So we started looking at this when we, uh, when we started talking about um, teleos or bony fish and some of the challenges they face. And of course, we start looking at, I'm not gonna go obviously revisit the entire lecture, but remember marine teleos live in an environment, the ocean, that is saltier than the inside of their bodies. So if the ocean is saltier and we're talking about osmosis, we're looking at water leaving. Um, at the same time, salt, which is more concentrated out, outside, the tendency is for it to diffuse in. So we've got this problem with water loss and salt gain which obviously can't be the way things work in what we call osmoregulators, right? These are animals that maintain their osmotic balance. So the animal has to overcome that, and we learned that strategies that of marine teleos, how they're able to minimize the water loss. Remember, they basically excrete very little, very small concentration of urine. And of course, we also spoke about the chloride cells, their function that are located in the gills. Then we spoke about freshwater fish, oops, which have kind of the, really the opposite balance, um, opposite problem where they're looking at gaining water um, because there's more water outside than in and losing salt is the problem. So we spoke okay. about ways, yes? I have a question for marine teleos, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. So for, um, in marine teleos, I was just wondering, like within the chloride cells, do both sodium and chloride uh, use the NKCC and the potassium pump? Is that what they both utilize to exit the cell? So the, the NKCC is used, of course, yes, to um, pull sodium and chloride into the cell from the blood. That's exactly, so they both go in the same direction. Now, what happens is not all the sodium leaves and so whatever sodium is still left in the cell is pumped back in to, into the blood to sort of maintain that gradient. But to answer your question, yes, you need that active um, NKCC pump to move sodium and potassium, actual well, sodium, and chloride out. Now, ultimately, that pump is used to move them from the blood into the cell. When they actually leave the cell and go into the water, they do use a couple different mechanisms, like they go through facilitated diffusion. But that NKCC is necessary for them to, um, to build up a gradient for them to eliminate sodium and chloride. Yes. OK, thank you so much. Sure, sure. Um, and if we take a look at um, moving on into amphibians, um, we spoke about, and of course, we look at the organs that animals use um, for osmoregulation. Remember, I, I emphasized, of course, yes, even though fish have kidneys, but really important organ are the gills, the chloride cells. Um, we spoke about amphibians, or at least adult amphibians who don't have gills, so we learned that kind of one of their main organs where they're able to um, handle sodium and chloride and water is their skin, right? So again, the important thing is knowing which direction sodium, chloride, and water are going in these animals as well as the main organ that plays a role in that. As we got into the marine reptiles and birds, um, what we spoke of, these are when we talk about marine, we talk about, again, the ocean. And again, these animals are dealing with the same issues that marine teleos are dealing with in the sense that um, they can gain excess, excess sodium, right? And they can lose water. Um, well, if we take a look at marine reptiles, they don't have chloride cells. 
their skin is uh, very thick. This is also true with marine birds as well. Um, so we learned about an organ called the salt gland. So what we're talking about here is all these animals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, marine reptiles, and marine birds, they all have kidneys, but the kidneys aren't enough to do what they need to do, right? To eliminate, if they need to eliminate salt, or if they need to gain salt. The organs that are able to accommodate that would be in fish, that would be the chloride cells that are found in the gills. In amphibians, that would be the skin. Um, the marine reptiles and birds, of course, that would be um, primarily the um, salt glands, like with seagulls and other animals, and they can excrete a lot of salt more than what their kidney is able, a, capable of, of excreting. Moving on to marine mammals. So um, with marine mammals, again, marine mammals deal with the main problems with other marine animals, and that is gaining too much salt and losing too much water. Um, fortunately, with marine mammals, their kidneys are evolved enough. They have a really nice long loop of Henle that is, allows them to excrete a very concentrated urine. Um, and they're able to um, get rid of that salt, but also not lose the water. So this is where we really started talking about the kidney in more detail. Um, to take, um, going from marine mammals to terrestrial animals, specifically more the desert animals, we spoke a bit about how they're able to do what they're able to do um, with living not only in a terrestrial environment, right, but, but also gets very hot and they can, because it gets very hot, they're also subject to dehydration, more detail. So their kidneys are especially, um, evolved so they have very long loops of henley we spoke about like the camels and the kangaroo rats right um, so that's their main way of adapting to an environment where there's very little water they're able to concentrate the urine excrete a concentrated urine excrete a lot of salts and not lose much water right the skin doesn't do much right in this case um, they don't have gills, they don't have salt glands, right? So it's really the kidney. Now I did mention other features as well, for example, that helps camels, remember I mentioned has the nose, especially adapted nose that when the animal exhales, normally when we exhale, in addition to getting rid of carbon dioxide, we also get rid of um, uh, water, right? We get uh, evaporated water. Well, the camel, by the nature of its nose, it's kind of like a sponge inside. As it's exhaling, the water gets retained in the nose, so it doesn't lose as much. Um, again, I also mentioned the fact that the, the camels have fur enables them to maintain, to not lose as much water and to kind of maintain their temperature. So the fur and the nose are really important for camels. With kangaroo rats, remember I mentioned that they really, um, their main, really they're virtually their only source of water is metabolic water. Um, they live primarily underground. Um, they excrete very concentrated urine. So we spoke about different kind of adaptations. They don't sweat, they don't lose water that way. So just kind of know the different strategies that each of these groups um, use. So that's kind of generalized how we're looking at handling water and salt. But of course, part of excretion is getting rid of nitrogenous waste. And we spoke about the different forms of nitrogenous waste um, and the different animals that excrete it. We spoke about ammonia. So you should know which animals excrete ammonia and why. Urea, which animals excrete it and why. Um, uric acid which animals excrete it and why. And of course, as we go from ammonia to uric acid, we're looking at less water needed to accompany that excretion. Um, so with uric acid, we primarily find with terrestrial animals, as I mentioned specifically with birds um, and some reptiles. Ammonia we primarily associate with fish, 
because ammonia is toxic, but that these animals are able to excrete a lot of water with it that, that kind of detoxifies it. All right. Uh, yeah, kidney is a huge topic, as you know. Um, okay, so then we spoke about the kidney um, functions of the system, the different organs, what's the function of the, of the ureter, the bladder, the urethra. We spoke about that. Um, <clears throat> the, main, the main organ of importance, even though all four organs are important, ure kidney, ureter, urethra, and bladder, Really, it's the kidney that plays a role in forming the urine. The other organs play a role in either transport or storage. Right. So you should know the anatomy of the kidney, you know what the components, what the main functional unit is. That would be the nephron. Remember, we spoke about you know, what makes it up, Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, and so on. I mentioned that, um, the kidney receives about one-fifth of the cardiac output with each circulation. So it has a very rich blood supply. It's important to be able to filter a lot of blood. So you should know the different blood vessels that are found in the kidney. Really the principal focus in this topic was what the kidney does, right? What are the processes of kidney function. Of course, we know there are mainly three. Uh, filtration, which we talk about right here. Um, absorption and secretion. So you should really know what the features are of each. Um, remember, um, filtration is the squeezing of, of protein-free plasma through the glomerulus across that membrane into the capsule and how that's determined by the balance of different pressures, right? We mentioned, much like with capillaries, right? We spoke about, we spoke about a balance of osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. With filtration, remember we spoke about three pressures. So you should know what those are. Um, when we're, every organ, of course, has a way, we, we, there are strategies on determining um, how um, how efficient is that organ operating? We have ways of measuring breathing rate for respiration. We have ways of measuring cardiac output for the heart. One of the ways we can measure how the kidneys functioning is by measuring filtration by what we call GFR, glomerular filtration rate. So you should know what that is, what, what the measurement is. Um, and of course, the importance of recognizing how we need to maintain that filtration rate. We don't want it to get too high. That can cause kidney damage. We don't want it to get too low. That can lead to kidney failure, right? So both are not good. Um, and of course, we know with homeostasis, there's fluctuations going on in the body all the time, right? We have temp temperature goes up, we bring it down. Our blood pressure goes down, we bring it up. So with GFR, it's the same thing just by the conditions in the body, GFR can change. But as long as we've got mechanisms, primarily the myogenic response and the tubuloglomerular feedback response, this is how we ensure that the GFR stays where it should be. So you should know what those two different forms of regulation are. Um, I had a question about that too. Of course. Okay. So in the, you know, for it to bring blood pressure back up, you have to constrict the efferent arterial? Um, to bring... Um, GFR, I mean. Right, right. That's one way to do it, yes. So is that governed by the myogenic and the tubular group? Yeah, that response too, or? Okay, so that's a really good question. So um, we mentioned, of course, there's two, the two different arterials, right? that if you want to reduce blood pressure, reduce GFR going into the kidney, you would constrict the afferent arterial. But if you want to increase pressure, one way you can do it with efferent. And as far as the, that's a really good question. As far as the, the efferent arterial, as far as participating in the myogenic, my, my understanding is that it's not, and there's a lot that's still understood how much of a role that actually plays in 
keeping blood pressure up. It seems to be more in terms of, of um, if the blood pressure gets too low, we do that. Um, we, we, it, we appear to, it appears to be more of the role of the afferent arterial or the tubular glomerular, but the constriction of the efferent, which does raise GFR, um, is my understanding is that that is not part of that myogenic response. As far as how, how often it's involved and how much of a contribution it makes um, isn't really understood. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good, really good questions. Uh, all right, so we also spoke about, um, you know, maintaining GFR, obviously, and of course, what happens if, you know, I mentioned that the range of, of GFR that we're able to control, you know, between 180 and 80 liters per, per day, that's kind of how we're able to maintain it, but if it gets too low, um, we don't maintain GFR, and one of the reasons for that appears to be that low, if the blood pressure gets below 80, that is a, may be probably most likely a pretty good indication that there's some internal bleeding, and if you've got internal bleeding, the last thing you want is to keep filtering blood through the kidney. Um, you don't want to lose any more fluid, so it's a way of sort of shutting things down a bit, uh, and hopefully, obviously, we can get a handle and restore restore the, the uh, um, um, correct what the problem is, so GFR could be restored. But as long as the pressure drops or the GFR drops really low, again, it's a way of kind of protecting the organism by saying, well, the, the GFR is so low, um, this person's bleeding internally. We don't want any more blood to go. We don't want to maintain that filtration rate. All right, um, speaking of filtration, of course, um, filtration I mentioned kind of involves the squeezing of fluid across the kidney, the glomerulus into the renal um, corpuscle, in the Bowman's capsule, I should say. And of course, that involves the passage across a membrane called the filtration membrane. Um, this is a membrane kind of similar to a respiratory membrane where we have oxygen going across the alveoli into the blood. It's a very thin membrane. Um, but the features of this membrane, of course, it's very thin, which allows for rapid filtration, but also there's a couple layers to it. Remember, we have the, the um, fenestrated epithelium of the, of the glomerulus, which has pores in it. We have the basement membrane, and then we've got the podocytes. And remember, the podocytes are that cell that wrap around the glomerulus that um, allow their spaces between them. And it's sort of a way of allowing some small molecules to trickle into the capsule. It's not going to allow large molecules to go through like proteins. So that's the filtration membrane that is responsible for um, regulating what eventually goes from the capillary, the glomerulus, into the, into the Bowman's capsule, and eventually on their way into the tubules. All right, so that was the first process. The second one is reabsorption. And as I mentioned before, of course, roughly 99% of what is filtered that reaches the kidney tubules ends up returning back to the blood. Um, and that includes water, um, variety of different solutes, right? These are essential minerals, right? We need them. Um, glucose. Um, if you remember that chart, many of them are like up at 90, 95, 99%. In the case of glucose, it's 100% reabsorption. I think the only example was something like urea, which is maybe 50%, but you know, a good percentage of that is, is not reabsorbed, so it stays in the kidney, it stays in the tubule, eventually excreted. Some of the terms I used when we're discussing reabsorption included renal threshold, um, transport maximum. Um, those are the two main ones. And remember, renal threshold is the, is the plasma concentration. In other words, the concentration of a solute in the blood that if that level is higher, so you've got, if you've got a higher plasma concentration of a certain solute, it exceeds what we call the threshold, that means it won't be reabsorbed or would it, 
anything that goes above the, that level is going to be excreted. For example, I, I mentioned, for example, in the case of glucose, glucose, the renal threshold is about 180. That means that with the plasma concentration at 180, if 180, and this has nothing to do with the GFR, this is the concentration of the sugar. If you've got 180 or maybe 170 that enters into the kidney, all of that will be reabsorbed. Once you get to 180 and higher, that difference, whatever's higher, is not, you've essentially saturated all the carrier proteins. Um, all the SGLTs. And so what the, you basically tied them all up. There's nowhere for glucose to go but to be excreted. Okay, the transport maximum just refers to the rate of absorption when you've reached that renal threshold. All right, um, so we did talk a lot about glucose. Remember, that's something that's normally 100% um, reabsorbed unless someone is diabetic and it's not being treated and glucose levels get very high. If glucose, since glucose is reabsorbed, how is it reabsorbed? Remember I mentioned that we're always, when we're looking at movement of molecules across a cell, we're looking at two different paths, two different membranes. One, it's got to go from the tubule across the apical membrane into the cell. Once it's in the cell, it's got to go across the basal lateral membrane into the interstitial fluid and eventually into the blood. All right. Um, so how does it do this? Well, remember with glucose, we have the SGLT. That's the uh, sodium glucose link transporter. We're not going to talk about that now. You guys know about that. Um, that pulls glucose coupled with sodium into the cell. Once it's in the cell, glucose then via glute transporters goes by facilitated diffusion into the blood. Um, as I mentioned, there, one of the treatments for diabetes is SGLT inhibitors, which basically prevent the reuptake of glucose, thereby kind of trying to reduce one of the characteristics of hypoglycemia. Although obviously you do want some glucose to come back, right? You gotta have some glucose to, to feed the cells. All right, the other molecule we spoke about, and of course, a lot of things get reabsorbed, but I focused on two key ones. The next one is sodium transport. Um, sodium, of course, is an important ion involved in action potentials, right? Muscle contraction, a lot of different things. Um, it's, there's two different mechanisms, how it's pulled across the um, apical membrane. One is coupled with that SGLT, right? And the other is essentially just through a sodium channel, which we would call facilitated diffusion. Once sodium is in the cell, it's pumped out by active transport. Sodium is pumped out, pumps it into the interstitial fluid and into the blood and then potassium is pulled back in. All right, so those are the two different ways it's transported, different mechanisms of transport. Um, then we started getting into endocrine. So this was, we've heard about these, uh, these hormones before, um, and we're, you're gonna hear about them again, <laughs> third time in the endocrine system. But, um, the endocrine system plays a role in controlling, even though we have this path of sodium uptake, glucose uptake, things like that, um, we have a way of regulating how much water gets pulled in, how much sodium gets pulled in. And this is dependent upon, in many cases, on blood pressure, on blood volume. One of the things we learned that, of course, if the um, blood pressure, blood volume gets too low, this activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, so you should know that, right? And know how that affects sodium uptake. I like this as well, I'm sort of behind on these, here we go. Not that you need them, but anyway. Um, so that's a response to low blood pressure on sodium regulation. What about water? Right, you know, we know water is reabsorbed, 
right, normally, but there are certain conditions, you know, the body changes where we're sometimes we're dehydrated. We can't just absorb water in the same way we did before. Maybe we've got to reabsorb more. Um, and this is where ADH, otherwise known as vasopressin, kicks in. Um, and remember, that's produced in the hypothalamus and acts and is stored in the pituitary, and that promotes water uptake. You should know how by way of those um, aquaporins. Remember, we spoke about those. So these are two, way, two different pathways that respond to if the blood pressure, blood volume is too low. What happens if the blood pressure is too high? That's where this cardiac hormone called ANF or ANP, atrial natriuretic factor or peptide comes in. And this basically antagonizes what's going on in these previous two. Instead of, instead of reabsorbing or, or uptake of water and sodium, we excrete it, which helps to lower the pressure. Finally, the third concept is secretion. I spent very little time on it other than just to know what it means. Remember, instead of substances entering into the kidney across the glomerulus, they're entering into the kidney through the peritubular capillaries. And what gets in there are other substances. I think I may have mentioned potassium, certain metabolites, certain uh, drug metabolites, antibiotics, other medication gets secreted in this fashion. One of the other important roles of the kidney, of course, is regulation of pH. Um, we know, of course, the respiratory system does that very well with regulating how fast or how slow we breathe, hyperventilation, hypoventilation. But the kidney is also very important because depending on our, if, if we're in a neutral condition like a normal pH or if we're in an acidotic or a alkalotic condition determines how these specialized cells of the collecting duct called intercalated cells work. Remember we have type A and type B. If things are too acidic, we pump out hydrogen into the urine, which helps to stabilize the pH. If things are too basic, we pump out um, bicarbonate in exchange for chloride. Remember, that's another example of the chloride shift. Um, one thing, of course, when hydrogen is pumped out into the kidney during acidotic condition, it's pumped out in exchange for potassium. This is called a proton pump. All right, so we're literally at the end of renal. Um, we're looking at excretion, and we spoke about this concept of renal clearance, what that really means. Um, basically, it refers to the amount of, 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 of fluid it takes to completely eliminate a substance. Um, and we learned certain clearance rates, for example, at the extremes. For example, we learned that glucose clearance rate is zero because glucose normally is not excreted. It's completely reabsorbed, right? And then we spoke about something like inulin, right? How, what the clearance rate for that is. Remember, we spoke about that the clearance rate of inulin is exactly the rate of the GFR, which tells us that inulin is filtered, it's not reabsorbed, and there's no secretion. So what goes in is equal to what goes out. And that's how you could tell if something is, if there's any reabsorption or secretion, right? If the clearance rate exceeds the GFR, that means that you had some secretion. If the clearance rate is less than the GFR, that means you had some reabsorption. All right. Excuse me. All right. Um, finally, we talked about micturition, which is the process of urination. Um, just understand the mechanisms involved. What are the components? Remember, I mentioned that we're looking at a couple different target areas, the detressor muscle of the bladder. We spoke about the internal and external urethral sphincters and the role of the different aspects of the nervous system, right? So remember, of course, the autonomic, and you'll have to know the details about this, but remember the autonomic 
in response to the stretch of the bladder, there are stretch receptors in the detressor muscle. This activates the autonomic system. You should know which branch. And the autonomic nervous system responds by causing contraction of the detressor muscle. And at the same time, relaxation of the internal sphincter. So if you think of these sphincters as closed, right, urine's not going to get through. But when the signal to urinate comes through, comes in, you squeeze the detressor muscle, open up the internal sphincter. Well, but that's not going to allow you to urinate because you still got the external sphincter that's closed. So in order for that to open up, you depend upon the somatic branch of the peripheral nervous system. This is the voluntary, this is the willful decision that once that's activated, the somatic nervous system triggers the relaxation of the external sphincter. And that's when you pee. Say if you're driving on the freeway, you're far away from a rest stop, you hold it. Then you see a rest stop up in Oceanside. Um, of course, I'm asking, talking about this for a friend, of course. Um, no. Um, anyway, um, once you've decided you're going to go, then the somatic branch of the, of the peripheral nervous system relaxes the external sphincter, and that allows you to urinate. That's the micturition reflex. All right, so we're now on the final, actually the last two topics. Um, the next one, and of course these are they kind of overlap in some sense because when we we're talking about the urinary system, we did speak about chemicals, really hormones that can influence it. But now with the endocrine system, we're talking about those as well as others. So first of all, we learned what hormones are, what, you know, some of the properties, remember one of the properties of hormones, which distinguishes them from neurotransmitters, is the fact that they're released into the blood and circulate. We spoke about the, that the fact that hormones are made by endocrine organs. Um, we spoke about the primary ones, which are the ones that that's all they do, that as far as we know, to make hormones. And then we spoke about the secondary ones, which are the ones that have another function, such as the heart, such as the kidney, right? But then they also produce hormones. All right. Um, being that hormones are chemical messengers, it made sense to kind of do a little comparison, comparing them with this, the function of the endocrine system with the nervous system. Um, both involve chemical messengers. One's neurotransmitter, one is hormone. However, then we got into a little murky, kind of like, kind of like a gray area in the sense that there are some hormones that instead of being produced by classical endocrine glands like the thyroid or the adrenal are actually produced by nerves. Um, and the example I used for that was the um, ADH and oxytocin that are produced in the hypothalamus but are stored in the pituitary. They're called neurohormones because they're produced by a neuron, but they're also called hormones because they're released into the blood as opposed to across the synaptic cleft. All right, um, then we spoke about a little history, just kind of a little teaser of some key historic figures. Remember, we spoke about Berthold and the chickens um, and some of the other people. You saw that chart of all the different hormones, right? Um, and of course, there are many. Um, but if we think of biochemistry, what are these hormones made of? What, are they, what is their basic constituent? We learn, of course, that hormones could be amines. They could be things like peptides. They could be steroids. So you should know kind of examples of which ones are amines. Remember, uh, thyroid hormone is an amine. Um, you know, things like that, proteins, peptides. And exam yeah, exam properties and examples of, of each. You know, which ones bind to a membrane receptor? Which ones bind to a, an intracellular receptor? cytoplasmic, nuclear, even mitochondrial. Um, in addition to the classifying the hormones, as far as steroid, peptide, amine, 
we also know that, that in solution, some of these hormones dissolve very well in an aqueous solution. They're known as hydrophilic. Some hormones do not dissolve well in an aqueous solution. These are lipophilic. And when I mean aqueous solution, the good example would be blood, right? Blood is aqueous solution, um, mostly water. So if something doesn't dissolve in water, it's probably going to be a problem for it to circulate through the blood. So that's why we spoke about different aspects. For example, that hydrophilic hormones can easily be transported on their own, but lipophilic hormones such as the steroids, such as thyroid hormone, um, need a carrier protein to get it in through, get it into the circulation to the target organ. And of course, once they reach the target organ, those lipophilic hormones cross the membrane, cell membrane of those target organs because they're lipophilic and bind to intracellular receptors. All right. So pretty much for the rest of the endocrine system, it was all about the organs, right? What are the hormones? What is their structure? I mean, what are the glands? What is the structure? What are the hormones that they're making? And what is their function? So for example, we know that the pituitary is made up of an um, anterior and posterior lobe. In retrospect, there is an intermediate lobe, but in adults, it's basically um, 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 non-functional. So I didn't really talk about it. Some of the hormones, remember things like ACTH, what their function is, for example, remember that goes to the adrenal cortex, stimulates the release of cortisol. Um, the way, of course, we also spoke about how the pituitary, so when I talk about the pituitary, of course, it's important to recognize both the anterior and posterior, right? Um, the way the, the anterior pituitary hormones are regulated, that's one of the things that we learned, is that it used to be believed that the pituitary was the master gland that it controlled everything. Well, then it was learned later that the hypothalamus, which is above it, produces hormones that influence the pituitary. Um, so we learned about things like CRH that stimulates ACTH that goes to the pituitary, or it goes to the um, adrenal. So kind of know that whole axis. Um, I mentioned the portal system. That's that very unique capillary bed or like a dual capillary structure that's important in delivering and plays a role in the efficient delivery of hypothalamic hormones right to the anterior pituitary. Um, and then going all the way through, just know, you know the adrenal gland, what it looks like, you know, what are the hormones, what are their functions. Um, you know, we spoke about, remember, the fasciculata, the glomerulosa, what are the hormones produced by those? Um, we also mentioned the regulation of adrenal hormone secretion. So this is quite interesting, right? We learned that not all hormones are regulated by the pituitary. Cortisol is regulated by ACTH, right? But we also learned that aldosterone is not regulated by ACTH at all, it's under the influence, remember, of blood pressure. Remember, blood pressure, low blood pressure activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, I mentioned there's a rhizona reticularis that produce androgens, but that's all I really want you to know about that. No other detail. Um, so all what I spoke about was the adrenal cortex. There's also the adrenal medulla, which, of course, is really a component of the sympathetic nervous system pathway in the sense that it produces norepinephrine and epinephrine. It's connected to the sympathetic pathway. Um, and then going down the list, thyroid gland structure, what are the hormones being produced? What is their function? Um, we spoke about thyroid pathologies and really namely uh, making, making too much thyroid hormone, making not enough. Um, what does that mean? You know, what are the effects? And that's one of the interesting things about we're looking at the endocrine system, right? Once you know what a hormone's doing, 
it's pretty clear as far as what the symptoms should be if you're making too much of it or not enough. If the effect of a hormone is to raise blood pressure to, you know, or in response to low blood pressure, well, if you're producing too much of that hormone, you might have a situation where instead of your blood pressure being restored to normal, it's way over. So you can have certain types of tumors, like there's an aldosterone tumor that will result in um, hypertension. We didn't talk about that, but I'm just going on and on. Um, all right, regulation of thyroid hormone. Remember, T3 and T4 are regulated by the pituitary and hypothalamus. But remember, calcitonin, much like aldosterone, is more the influenced by, the, in this case, the levels of calcium. Calcium dictates it, whereas remember, aldosterone, it's influenced by the levels of sodium. Then we looked into the parathyroid hormone. And remember, this is a hormone that, um, like calcitonin, responds to changes in calcium, but responds to changes in the other direction. So remember, calcitonin, if you've got hypercalcemia, too much calcium in the blood, this hormone delivers calcium to the bone, kind of lowering it. With parathyroid, if you don't have enough calcium in the blood, this mobilizes and moves calcium back to the blood. But remember, it's by three different pathways, via the bone, via the intestine, and via the kidneys. Then we took a look at the pancreas, and pancreas does produce, it's believed, maybe five or six hormones, but we really focused on just two of them, um, the two antagonistic hormones, namely um, glucagon and insulin. And um, we sh you should know, for example, where in the pancreas they're produced, what cells make them, um, what factors influence it. Remember, this is also not under real pituitary hypothalamic control. This is under the influence of glucose levels. Glucose too high, glucose too low, which hormone is produced. Then we spoke about an interesting hormone called the pineal gland, which is responsible for the production of melatonin. Remember, this regulates in us really our circadian rhythms, not just our sleep-wake cycle, but basically our general rhythms throughout the body. When certain times that more enzymes are produced, certain times when you know certain hormones are produced, certain conditions. But it also has other functions, as I mentioned, with animals. It helps to kind of uh, regulate the timing of seasonal breeding animals. The heart, we already know about the hormone made by the heart and what it does. And then finally, we ended up with a discussion of some endocrinopathies. Um, again, the hyperhypothyroidism, we spoke about Cushing's. You can have primary or secondary Cushing's and what that means as far as what organ is causing it. Um, we, ended on, uh, we ended with diabetes, unfortunately. There's so much to talk about, but hopefully I kind of laid out as much as possible. Um, the different types of diabetes, what are some of the symptoms of diabetes, and what are some of the complications of it. Remember, we spoke about a lot of the complications are due to high blood sugar, right? You end up urinating a lot. You end up being fatigued because you're peeing out a lot of sugar. Um, you're also very hungry. Remember, I also mentioned the problems with high blood sugar and, and plaque buildup. We call it the cardiovascular effects. All right, um, the last topic, which is a relatively short one, but I think it was quite informative, is we focused about um, the types of digestive systems in farm animals. That should have an S there, but farm animals. Um, remember, we spoke about monogastric versus ruminant versus hindgut fermenters, which animals, um, which animals are in each of those categories. In monogastrics, 
even though they might seem very different in many ways, um, birds and mammals are both monogastrics, right? Even though birds have very different lungs than we do, right? Um, but we've got the same, as remember, the virtually the same hearts and virtually the same um, digestive system. Obviously, there are differences. Remember, we spoke about the main organs that everyone's familiar with, esophagus, stomach, intestine. But remember, we spoke about some variations in that in the bird, where you've got the gizzard, the proventriculus, the crop. Remember, we spoke about those. And of course, the, the exit, which is the cloaca. Um, when we're talking about, of course, the purpose of the digestive system, of course, is we're consuming foodstuffs that have nutrients that are not accessible, right? So we're breaking them down. And we need to break them down to liberate those nutrients. And then once those nutrients are liberated in the digestive tract, we need to absorb them into the blood. So we spoke about how we absorb carbohydrates. And this is kind of a throwback, right, to um, talking about transport systems, where remember carbohydrates such as glucose are pulled in from the gut in much the same way as the kidney, SGLT, and then facilitated diffusion through glutes. Um, we spoke about fatty acid absorption. I didn't talk about amino acids or proteins. Um, then we got into functional anatomy of ruminants. So remember ruminants, again, they have the same organs as, as monogastrics do. The only difference is their stomach is four, has four chambers, and it's huge, right? Um, we learned why they've got those four stomachs. Obviously, their diet is different. They, they, they don't sit down to have, you know, chicken wings or you know rice pilaf or or salmon right they eat roughage and what allows them to eat roughage like hay at the same time one of the reasons why we don't has to do with the nature of their stomach remember their stomach they they're packed full of protozoans as well as um, other bacteria which have the ability to break down a lot of the cellulose, convert it into volatile fatty acids, which can be then converted into glucose, right? So we think volatile fatty acids, we've got glucose, what about proteins? Well, remember the proteins, most of the proteins in a, in a ruminant's diet, remember cattle, sheep, and goats are a good example, come from the protein that's in microbes. And with millions and millions and millions of microbes, um, cattle get a lot of protein. Um, so they, they um, with enzymes in their gut, they're able to break down the cell wall of the bacteria, extract the protein, break it down, absorb it. And you might think, well, gosh, what about the bacteria? Well, bacteria being microbes, they're constantly replacing themselves, right? Rapid cell division, rapid, you know, What's the word? Binary fission. I'm trying to remember my microbiology. Um, so it's the, the stomach that is what we call a fermentation vat, where that's where the bacteria are doing their thing. Hind gut fermenters, and the examples I use would be horse, horses, and rabbits. Um, as the name implies, the hind gut is where fermentation occurs. Okay, so if you think of the mid gut as really kind of like the stomach, and the foregut as the esophagus, the hindgut is the intestine, and principally the large intestine. Remember, the large intestine consists of cecum, um, the colon, and the rectum. Where most of this fermentation occurs, it's primarily in the cecum and the, the colon. And I didn't mention this in class, but you guys are here, plus people see it on video. Comparing rabbits to horses, in the case of horses, the colon is really the primary spot where fermentation occurs. With rabbits, it's primarily the cecum. It's still the hind gut, but just a different compartment. And it does what's very similar to what we saw with the cattle. It takes the roughage that these animals are eating, breaks them down to vol the cellulose and things like that into volatile fatty acids, into glucose. 
These animals do get the microbial protein, but here's the problem. Um, the microbial protein now are down in the large intestine, which is past the point where you can really efficiently reabsorb them, absorb them into the blood. So a lot of that protein is lot would be lost. Um, so there has to be typically some protein supplementation in these hindgut fermenters such as horses. Um, with rabbits, and again, I didn't talk about this in class, um, but they do what's called their coprophages, where they actually, not exactly exciting to hear, but they eat their feces. They eat their feces because the feces that are coming out have a lot of protein. They're able to re-digest it and get the protein out of it. So, all right. Um, I guess that is it. Let me go back to stop share. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, I know our main questioner looks like she left. Um, those of you that came in a little bit later, I did email you yesterday, but just know unless you've made arrangements with me for accommodations, uh, um, the exam is going to be Thursday between one and five. You've got 90 minutes to complete it. Um, and that's it. Um, unless you're going to do extra credit, extra credit will be due Friday. Just go through that video and, and talk a bit about the interesting transport mechanisms and things like that on there. Um, it's really interesting. If you haven't looked at the video, um, Dr. Quentin does a really an amazing job. He's a really good speaker, um, really good, good researcher as well. Um, so that's it. I mean, the, so the last time we're going to actually, if you can call it seeing each other, um, will be on Thursday because there will be no class tomorrow. You have an extra day to study. Um, so any questions, other questions? I've got another question if that's okay. Sure, Gina. So for the, um, in the, the first lecture for osmoregulation, you talked yes. about like the countercurrent for birds in their sweat glands. Um, yeah. Is that something we should know in detail or? I wasn't really sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's really, yeah, that you really picked up and that's good. I did mention it. Um, I'm not gonna ask you anything about that. Um, the re I, I brought it, it's, it, it's, it is a very important process. The reason why I brought it up is just to kind of illustrate when we were talking about countercurrent with like the gills and the respiratory system, how countercurrent also plays a role in this case in sodium excretion. But um, having said that, um, I'm not gonna ask you any questions on that. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Okay, well. I had, oh, sorry. Ahead, I, I had yeah. another question too. So in the, um, lecture where you talked about like the movement of glucose and sodium. Right. I was still kind of confused about like the electrochemical gradient and like their movement. If you could explain that again. Okay, so let me go ahead. I'm going to see if I uh, go ahead and pull up the the um, slide. Actually, that might even be better. So give me a second. Okay. Um. movement of glucose so that was like the sglt thing right uh, yeah okay i think that was your nervous system hi Ry. Oh, yeah. no i just said hi to you <laughs> yeah no just give me i'll be done in a minute go ahead you hi, can say hi now hi i'm dad my I'm your, <laughs> I'm your professor's son. Yeah, that's it's Ryan. If you want to, yeah, you can. If you want to show your face here, you can. There he is. Hello, Hi, Ryan. <laughs> um, okay, how was practice? Good. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. He just got back to baseball practice. They've actually started practice again, which is nice with all this COVID stuff. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay. 
Um, was this what you meant, this one? Oh, you, you probably don't see it. Let me go back. Yeah, I don't see it. Yeah. This thing is really weird. It's like if I don't do it exactly just the right way, it mess. Let's see. Hold on. Uh, okay, Rai. Let me. Uh, what the heck did I do? Hold on one second. We can see it now. You can, Oh, you you can't. Okay. Oh, now it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll find it again. Hold on. Oh, brother. All right. <laughs> Let's see, one more time here. Okay, let me go back to this. New controls, new share, and you should see it. Well, you should see the slides now. You should see it now. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so is this what you meant? Yeah, kind of. So like, um, I wasn't really sure what you meant in terms of like the electrochemical gradient and like, I guess they're going opposite each other. Or I'm not sure. Okay. I kind of sped through that. So I can kind of understand your, your yeah, confusion. Um, so the main point I was trying to get across, obviously, is that um, obviously glucose has to go across two membranes to eventually get into the blood. Um, Going across the apical membrane, it depends upon SGLT. And um, glucose is typically much higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. So that's one thing I didn't mention. Glucose is low outside and high inside. Normally, it wouldn't be able to get in because it's going against its gradient. What provides it with the energy to get into the cell is this um, gradient of sodium, which is higher outside than in. So the electrical, when I mean the electrochemical gradient, I'm really referring to sodium. So sodium is higher outside than it is inside, just like a typical neuron. So the drive, the electrochemical drive is for sodium to go down its gradient from high concentration to low into the cell. That downward movement, that downward electrical gradient movement um, provides the energy, and I don't mean energy in the form of ATP, basically provides the, the, the I don't know, the, 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 the kinetic energy that's going to pull glucose in along with it. Um, so the, it's the electrical chemical gradient of sodium going from high concentration to, to low that's providing the energy that's going to allow glucose to go against its gradient. Now you might wonder, well, what, I mean, eventually sodium's gonna build up here. Well, then there is also a sodium potassium ATPase that's gonna take sodium back out of the cell. So that's gonna keep that gradient. So that's kind of, that's really what I was referring to. But I, and I guess just because I'm go, trying to go through so many things, I didn't, I didn't elaborate on that. But um, so just for all intents and purposes, the electrical chemical gradient of sodium provides the energy that pulls glucose into the, into the cell against its gradient. That's what I was referring to. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay. And then now glucose is at a high concentration inside the cell. And so now it can go down its gradient from high to low by facilitated diffusion outside the cell. So that's typical facilitated diffusion. So is that, that is, that, is that kind of what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I, no, I'm glad you're bringing this up because you know it's, it's a short semester and trying to go through a lot of stuff and teaching this for so long, sometimes it's easy to zip through. And plus, this the whole um, the whole environment we're in. It's like not being face to face. It's it's really hard because you know to to kind of know what people are thinking. But thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Hey, professor. Hey, Daniel. How are you doing? Oh, hanging in there. How about you? <laughs> you ready for are, you're not taking the second session are you uh no not good yeah i don't know if it, is anybody taking the second session 
I am, but it's like a writing class. So oh, okay. I think it'll be different. Yeah. When, when does that start? I think July 7th. Oh, you get it like a whopping couple days. Yeah, I know. I get the 4th of July weekend. And that's oh, brother. Uh, yeah, so Daniel, you had a question? Yeah, uh, I just had a question. So when it's the same lecture that you were just on, but a different topic, for the ap when the apiarian arterial constricts, right? You were talking about that? Right. Is that the myogenic response or the tubular uh, glomerular feedback? Or is that both? Ah, you guys, those are really good questions. Okay, so in both the myogenic response and the tubular glomerular feedback, in both cases, the afferent arterial is constricting because both of those mechanisms are there to reduce blood flow into the kidney. Now, the way they do it is, di is different. With the myogenic response, that's very direct. If blood pressure is gone up, increased blood flow, that causes the aff afferent arterial to stretch, and then it recoils. It gets real small to reduce blood flow. With the tubuloglomerular feedback, that's more of an indirect pathway. And that's where once the filtrate has gone into the kidney, so say there's high blood pressure, increased blood flow, that means increased filtration rate. That means you've got more filtrate in the kidney within a particular unit of time. By the time that filtrate reaches the distal tubules, we've got these macula densa cells that have chemo sensors, chemoreceptors and they pick up the amount of solute. And they're used to, their, I guess they're, they're uh, calibrated, for lack of a better word, to, to see you know, what the right level should be, much like blood pressure receptors. And if they sense higher than normal levels of solutes, or maybe higher than normal levels even of fluid, they produce a paracrine or a molecule which has been identified as adenosine, that adenosine travels back to the afferent arterial and causes the afferent arterial to constrict. So both are doing the same thing, but one of the things we find about body, the mechanisms in the body, we often find this sort of like duplicate, um, two pathways that are kind of accomplishing the same thing, which you might wonder why is it doing that? Well, it's kind of, a, I feel like to think of it as almost like a backup you know, it's like, you know, if both are working, that's great. If one fails, you still have the other one. So, um, so to answer your question, at the end of the day, you're both looking at constriction of the afferent arterial, which is going to reduce blood flow into the kidney, which will thereby bring GFR back to its normal level. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Okay. Definitely. Thank yeah, you guys are asking awesome questions. This is so cool. Um, anyone else? Are there going to be like plus and minus grades in this class or no? Um, well, with SDSC, so the, actually, I should ask you guys this. I mean, so at Mesa, you know, it's like ABC. You know, it's no plus or minuses. I know SDSU, you guys do have that. Um, and obviously, everyone has their different opinions. <laughs> like... You know, if you're at the low end of an A, you'd rather have an A than an A minus. Um, so you don't want the um, pluses and minuses. By the other sense, say if you're at, at where you should have a B plus, instead of a B, you want that. So, um, I mean, I'm thinking I'm gonna go ahead and do it. And that's what I've done in the past. And it seems like, you know, it's one of those things, uh, have you had some classes where your instructors don't do pluses and minuses? Yeah, I, I have. You have? Yeah, I, I've had both. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always done plus and minus. It's just the way. So, and I guess then this is probably a difficult one to get into. I'm just going to stick with plus and minus. Um, some of you guys, it may not make any difference. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to stick with that. Okay, so then is there like a cutoff, like what that would be, or? Yes, and I, I'm, I, will, I will go ahead and let you know. I'll kind of email that out to you so you'll kind of know what the cutoff range is. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. All right, I'll see you guys. Well, I'll, next time we'll, 
be in contact. Well, you, you can call me anytime between now and the end of the semester, but um, I guess I'll see you sometime on Thursday. Have a good one.